Well, thanks for doing me the honor of asking me to speak. Whenever I'm asked to do something like this, um, something I've not done before, I always feel a stab of fear, and my shadow self tells me I'm not qualified to do it. I need to speak on stage and hear other people's voices, not to my own. Um, and whether it's to be the shop of the people charity, or to play Gandhi, or to speak to a group of eminent people such as yourself. Um, but I also have a practice of saying yes whenever the universe presents me with a, a challenge. So here I am. Um, as you know, I've just finished playing Gandhi at the National Theatre. Um, it was finished on that day in In um, Uncarma, trying to take a wonderful play, The Father of the Sapphire. We did it last year, and the National were not expecting it to be the success it was, and we were only supposed to do it once, but we sold out, and um, people couldn't get tickets, and so they all stuck. Which I think, you know, it's a play that was on in the biggest theatre of the Olivia, 1200 season. They were not expecting us to sell out. It was a fully British, Asian, and Asian cast. There was no one famous in it, no one famous writer. But I think something about the resonance of Gandhi that, that touched the people, that they didn't miss. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about the play. So the play begins with um, Nathuram Gorsi, who, who was done as a set. And he speaks to the audience like this, and he suggests to them that after they've heard his version of events, they might end up building temples in his honor. Now, this is happening in India, in some places. So, Anu Palma is from Kenya. She's born and raised in India. And she wants to write this play as a reflection about India, but also about the world. It's a very set of universal topics. And I think that's why it really was, people were just wanting. Um, so in one way, this play is an examination of what might turn someone into a premeditated murderer. It presents world world worldview and that of his mentor, Sarah It also presents Gandhi's worldview all the way through the play. And we follow Gandhi's life and Gurdjieff's life until they meet that fateful day. And then there is an imagined conversation at the end of the play where they confront each other. Um, but I also like to think, I mean, Palmer is a very delicate writer. And it's a play that is anti polarization, which I think is one of the great uh, evils of our current society. It's an anti personal culture play. It asks you to put aside your prejudices and genuinely stand in this young man's shoes. Walk with him for two hours. It's what Gandhi would have liked us to do, I think. And then it suggests we make up our own. So I've been asked to talk to you a little about what brought me to the place of playing Gandhi, how I prepared, how I used the practice of spinning to deepen my performance, and what I learned in this process. So a little bit about me. My parents were born and bred in Chennai, and they moved, both moved to England in the early 60s. I was born in 1968 in South London, and I grew up in a very humble, non-artsy setting. There were no books in my house, there were no artists in my family. But there was a lot of delicious Indian food and a family, and an extended family, who spoke of this magical place that I've never visited. Um, I still have a lot of in family in India, but we didn't have funds in the 70s to go visit. In fact, my dad never saw a lot of his brothers and sisters again. The India of the 50s and 60s that they described, my parents, my uncle, and uncles, it seemed colourful and vibrant and alive in a way that England, still England in the 70s, didn't see when I was a child. I think actually what was going on, which is what happens with a lot of immigrants, first generation immigrants, was that they were equating their youth with the place they were up. And they were bemoaning being middle aged, you know, the amount of conscience. But as a child, that passed um, away. I, though, I was a timid child. And I was not 40, and I, because of this maybe, I suffered from the malaise that many second generation women suffer from. And that is that I never felt quite at home 
or welcomed in the only country that I'd ever lived in. It's a very strange place, back in the United Kingdom. Um, and maybe that was the thing that made me turn, I don't know. But it certainly made me, and I felt that I was very easily spotted in my difference because of the colour of my skin. I also felt uns- uh, um, an unsettling fear of lots of people that were scared of dark, dead, bullies, um, the disapproval of authority figures. Things that I discovered that Gandhi was, was a very, very frightened and timid child. So, uh, one of the seminal experiences of life after was with our family going to the Oberlin in Inkshaw and seeing Richard Attenborough still in Gandhi. And I was 14 when it came out. And it was unusual for lots of reasons. It was unusual because my mum and dad came with me, and my dad never went to the cinema. Um, secondly, we were at the cinema on a weekday evening, and it was full of adults. And it was full of Indian, South, South Asian people, lots of saris and beautiful turbans, and, you know, people who I didn't expect to see it so. And finally, the subject matter indelibly marked it. Ben Kingsley's beautiful performance captured this small, frail man who wielded a power that was not violence, that could could overcome violence. To a child brought up on Star Wars and Tom and Jerry, this was revolutionary. But I felt changed, but I had no idea what to do with that information. I was still scared of the voice of school. Um, I didn't know that Gandhi's teaching methods could be learned and applied to my own. So I taught sanctuary and drama at school. This was a relatively safe place where I, where I felt I could be seen without being at risk. Um, and I still realized that people seemed to like what I was doing, but to make people laugh. And I could move them, and it was addictive. So, being from a little bit sandwich, I had no conception that I could do this as a living. My dad wants me to go to the computer, and, and so did I, really. I was very risk averse as a child. But finally, at sixth form, my, um, my bravery met my rebellious spirit, and, and I decided to go to high school. And from there, an active career developed. And I've had some very lean time for the years. But I've also been lucky enough to work at the very highest levels with some of the most talented people in the world. Um, being a South Asian heritage actor in the late 80s, early 90s was, was a big step in something that I was barred from. I wasn't going to be doing any um, period dramas, not like the others. Um, but other things were meant I could play South Asian roles, South Asian roles. And my wife and the script writer and I managed to pay the bills and bring up two children, so it's quite okay. But I I was also missing something. I couldn't quite meet all my needs. My parents are Christian, and my dad loved to sing in the choir. So I was up in the church as a kid, and I loved the idea of Jesus, and of course, he did not God's testimony. But I couldn't make sense of the fact that, according to my church, my friends who were non Christian wouldn't go to heaven. And I just didn't buy So I left the church at 18. And then I had a few years of drama school of hedonism and acting as religion, which I, I wouldn't recommend. Uh, I really don't think for happy life. Um, but I've always been drawn to environmentalism. I don't know why, because I grew up in the most suburban setting, you know, time and dark. But I, I was drawn, I joined Greenpeace when I was young. And, and so I, I was trying to put the shamans and reflect on it. And in it, I found one month uh, a review of a book called Your Light is Your Message. By a meditation teacher called Edna Hushman, who had written this in Carol. Um, and it was about Gandhi's life and his message. And I was hooked. I was in the early 20s and I just I felt to meditate and myself and my journey to learn more about Gandhi and his philosophy. Each one had also written what became to me the most important book about Gandhi. It's a book called Gandhi the Man. And it's an examination of how Gandhi transformed himself from a timid child of an average lawyer into the man who overcame an empire without firing a shot. And it concentrates on his spiritual journey, not on his political journey. Because Western culture loved to keep Gandhi in the box of politicians. Western culture loved to think of him as a 
brilliant strategist, etc. Et it yeah. absolutely does not like to consider the direction of force from which it's bred can. But to me, all the great leaders of the last century are people who were essentially powered by spirits. Desmond Tutu, Martin Luther King, Dalai Lama. There's a lot of clever people out there, but not people I would want to end with, apart from people like that. I met one of Eastern's students, he was a professor called Michael Nagel, last year. He taught a course on guardian nonviolence at Berkeley University, and he now runs the Methodist Nonviolence School. So I took him left the course while I had small children, and I'd be in the kitchen listening to all his lectures while I cooked food. Um, and it was about guardian philosophy, and that's when I became immersed in really detailed philosophy, particularly the two branches of the philosophy, um, which are a uh, constructive program and obstructive program. That was really a revelation to me. At the same time, and coincidentally, maybe, I was also asked for a voice to come of Ishan's <laughs> book, because Ishan had left very strict instructions on his pastor that his book should only be voiced for audio by someone who was a long term meditator. So they asked me to voice them. So I voiced the book, Guardian the Man, you can hear on the audio. And his meditation book. And I also voiced his biography of one of his great, um, one of Gandhi's great uh, followers, who was Abu Dhabi Khan, Masha Khan, who led the plants and spent up the first ever non violent army with I think the plants. But I also, at the same time, started voicing Eastern translations of guys to the Bhagavad Gita, who by the the Dhanavada of the Buddha. So I began to understand the Vedanta. As well, I began to understand the underpinning of Gandhi's philosophy. And I'm a believer that as actor, we are lucky that if you voice a book, even though you didn't write the book, something of it goes in on a different level to just reading it because we're trying to be a channel for the author's words. But I also practice nonviolence. Um, so I took a group on nonviolent communication, NBC. I don't know if any of you have. Nervous, the Marshall Rosenberg, this wonderful different thing. And for the first time, I started to feel like I might be able to fight that fear that I always had of violence, random violence, uh, violence in the street, violence at school. I was always been fighting with it. Because I instinctively knew that I wasn't the sort of person who would be strong enough to physically overcome most of the violence I could see in the world. But I started to think maybe here in the way that I just started to lose that fear through the power of the violence. My wife and I started to attend a Quaker meeting as well, uh, where I was eventually asked to sit in a committee that allocated resources to do grassroots peace building initiatives in the South. And I learned a lot from the Quakers, the way they organised themselves, their absolute commitment to non violence. And I learned a huge amount from working and supporting grassroots efforts in South Africa for peace, people doing very little, extraordinary work in their communities. Um, and I was finally, I was asked to join the beer board members in my NBC of a small peace building charity called Open Edge, that's in conflict, of which I'm at the moment the chair. Um, but I never thought I'd play dumb. I was then too young and I'm still too tall. Um, but time passes, and when the director of the Father of the Assassin in Guru Singh and asked me to play him at the National Theatre last year, I realized that maybe I had spent decades preparing for this role that I haven't been aware of. And this is not the way life presents itself to us often. Um, still, I warned the director that if she cast me, I would be a constant form in her son. Because Gandhi is bigger than us, he's bigger than a play. So if we were going to put him on stage, we had to be sure that every single word he spoke was in keeping with his philosophy. So I was lucky that Anne Palmer was a very generous player, and she was open to collaboration. And during my husband, I was constantly approaching desks. I used to dread him approaching desks with my copy of Gandhi the Man in my hand, asking them about a certain speech. I was constantly um, trying to project the chain or the cut or a more spiritual version of the same words. Um, Indu was much more interested in the political story. 
Um, she was very brilliant director, but quite a secular um, uh, person. And I was constantly uh, challenging that in lively conversations. Um, this is an exchange of summed up our discussions. There, there was a theme where we were preparing for the stock market. And um, India thought it was too long, so she said, we cut a few lines. And she said, oh, we can cut that line. That's not helping us tell the story. This is the line. Our cause is just, our means are strong, and God is with us. And I counted that they were the most important lines in the whole play. <laughs> and that she could cut anything else but that. And she said, well, I will cut other things. And I said, well, you have to keep us as we can. Um, but the rest of the cast grew accustomed to the long pauses while we batted back and forth, be suggestions to each other. Um, I think we managed to meet someone there. So, how did I prepare before rehearsals began? You know, playing Gandhi is, um, is an icon, so what, what are you carrying in approach? I knew an impersonation was not going to be good. I didn't look enough like them to start with. It wasn't going to be sat in front of the audience. I needed to portray something of the essence of God as a human being. Because what do you think? The way people are comfortable with them, they either want to pull them down or keep them on the, on the shelf as a myth. But then on the other hand, there's the devotee who's too dedicated to the holiness of the saint and you can't see any flaws in humanity. And I knew that if someone was still portrayed as perfect, then how can you wait to be the of them? Or, more importantly, emulate them. Um, so, a favorite, I think, technique of chance culture is to smear a figure from history so that we no longer have to consider their views or their teachings. And I, I wanted to show someone who was real so that you could avoid that trap. Um, if we ha if we discard everyone from history that said or did something we don't like, we have to discard, discard most of the knowledge of history. For instance, I'm fine with a man who was in an abusive relationship with Sir Clark, but are we going to discard the theory of relativity? I think it's. Um, and in fact, he became a huge fan of Gandhi's in his old age. So again, what point is someone's life are you going to judge? Gandhi wrote down pretty much every thought in his head for 60 years. And he, he's famous, he said, I am judged by what I say and believe today. What happened in the past is irrelevant to me. It's how the truth is exhibiting itself to me today. So you can take things he wrote maybe in the 1910s and 20s, and it's not necessarily bad or wrong, it's so dark. But one of the interesting things I've felt about Gandhi is that you can mention him to literally anyone and they know who he is. I've never come across that with big from history before. So I'd be in the greengrocer or the train station or wherever I was, and someone would say to me, because they'd recognize him and say, well, What are you doing at the moment? And I'd say, I'm doing a play, and most of the people are just plays. I'd be playing Gandhi, and everyone, every single person I ever said that to went, Oh, because everyone. Has an image in their head of a small man in the body who spoke about peace. They might know nothing else about him, but he is that iconic. Now, is it because his image is so memorable and easy to copy? It could be. It helped me, certainly, on stage. Um, or is it because there's something deep in this message and there's something revolutionary in nature of this life and she speaks to people? Maybe the first. So I had to try and find a human being to find that uh, initial reaction where everyone goes, I don't know, it. I started by avoiding any portrayals of them. I didn't want to things to them. All commentaries on them. Because I needed to return to the truth. So I read some of my films for truth. I read and reread Hind Swarov. I couldn't believe how pressing Hind Swarov is. It, it sounds like a man is a hundred years ahead, literally. But his thought document is the ancient of the people. Um, the philosopher Charles Eisenstein talks about 
we are up in our space between thoughts that are conscious. I think Gandhi speaks to this. Gandhi is addressing this gap where we find ourselves that he was ahead of everyone else, that he thought was so. So the still dominant story of rulers that has spread throughout the ruling classes of the whole world, but has become hollowed out to the sea story, is the story of separation. It's the weapon tool. It's the story of empires. It's the story of our attempts to dominate each and each other through history. In this materialist world, you and I are forever safe. What is good for you may not be good for me, and vice versa. In this world view, it is inevitable that I could try to maximize my good in all space and sort of. If the world where the only kind of source is physical, and the more of it you have, the more powerful you are. Eisenstein then identifies a new and ancient story that is springing up all over the world as we speak. Thich Nhat Khan calls it the story of interbeing. This is God's name. You and I, and all beings, are essentially one. We're different expressions of the same underlying consciousness. What harms you must eventually harm me. What is good for you must eventually be good for me. This is the place of my life and our lives. In this world of you, there are other powers in the universe. Some plans that are good. This is Gandhi's worldview, lifted up himself. And he brought that back into the modern world. And it's critical. Non violence. In English, it sounds like a negative of something. Non violence. But in Sanskrit, the word is only positive. It's much more like the English word flawless or plastic. The Upanishad say that Ahimsa is the highest standard. So Gandhi knew this, and he said about applying it to modern world. It's a worldview where, as B. R. Lumber said, you can lose every battle, but still win the war. This is crucial about Gandhi. For Gandhi, there was no distinction between the moral choice and the most effective or practical choice. He never had to make a choice between those two things, which is the activity of modern politics. So he was the philosophy. But who did that make him do? How did that make him an embodied individual? That's what I had to find because I was going to embody it. I found a wonderful documentary that some of you may have watched. It's called Mahatma. And it was produced by the Gandhi National Memorial Fund in cooperation with the films of the government of India. It was made in 1968. I can't imagine it being made now. It's five hours long, but it's absolutely absorbing. It contains virtually all the footage we have at home. So, of course, most of the book is silent. But what we see, as sometimes we do, is someone who is always laughing, always reaching out physically to friends and opponents alike. And someone who seems to be able to make no around him laugh if you watch carefully, whether it was Nehru or Jinnah or the West. I discovered a direct quote of his that, 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 that I love. If I didn't have a sense of humor, I would give myself long. <laughs> this image of the laughing sage very strongly brought to mind images of the Dalai Lama and Desmond Tutu. And I thought maybe he is a way in for me because I can study them very closely in a way that I couldn't study them. I've had a wonderful documentary about them called Joy. If you haven't seen it, Really watch it. It's so beautiful. The South African government wouldn't grant the Dalai Lama a visit, uh, a visa to visit the president. And so then completely went to spend some time with Dalai Lama in India. And it was a love time they were together and it was important. The documentary shows a few people who literally never saw that, always laughing, but who in the next round can be talking about deep spiritual truths, completely unashamed. In a way that in the West we have to teach us talking about faith and spirit, and they will just launch into it and to how it applies to the modern world. And they seem to be so much fun. They seem to be having so much fun. 
the difficulty of those two men face. The terrible tragedies. They think you much more fun than the Western theorists that I hear on and on on radio and TV. Who would you rather be stuck in the desert island with? Desert two or original and then what might be? There's a beautiful moment when the Dalai Lama is asked what truth he means. And he quietly says, When I'm on my deathbed, I will see the two people. The two people are moved, you can see the tears, and he just holds the cold hands. And then a minute later, they laugh again. So their voices and their physicality, especially their laughter, is something that I want to bring to the body of the film. So on stage, we have less than if we were making a film. We're not in a village anymore. We can't feel the heat or see the sky. But what we do have is culture. And when you move from a rehearsal room to the dress rehearsal on stage, that is the thing that can sometimes be a really difficult key to unlocking what it feels like. You know, we talk about standing with someone's shoe, well, then you get to the or in Garland's case, the job. When you move, um, so we were lucky enough that our designer, our just curious, really the designer, and she in particular knew Carly, the all our customers. And you know, Carly is the traditional hand for a clock, dark chapter. So she came up with Carly London, and he supplied us with all the Carly we needed. So suddenly I was on stage, looking around at people wearing Carly, and I was wearing a short rookie and a short all native. Beautiful colors. It's wonderful. It looks so wonderful. And the effect is so And I suddenly realized that Gandhi gave a great deal of power for wearing very little. He was always doing the thing that was seemed counterintuitive to our Western minds. He didn't need crowns or great hands. His power was increased by wearing very little. When he visited Buckingham Palace and he was here in the thirties, Churchill was enraged that he went to the, to the palace of his lord. And when he was asked about it, he said, um, the king was very nice, of course, for See, this, this humour is totally without malice. So beautiful. And it was the same Gandhi who stood in front of a crowd for palms in the border region when he went there. And he stood in front of them in his shawl, and they all had their rifles of sun over their backs. And he asked them, What are you doing? You have to take guns. I hear nothing. And they threw their guns on the ground. That was the beginning of the Khan's great movement against the British in the Northwest. So, even on stage, wearing so little, this can be a challenge. Um, it, it felt wonderful, and it had an effect on the actors around me, and I saw the effect it had, then I realised the power. The genius of Gandhi was that he would enact his principle of speech, always. So by deciding to only wear two items of clothing, feeling sick of everyone's spend time making one o'clock, to be vegetarian. Whatever the action, it spoke greater volumes than any preacher. And then when it was coupled with his work and his philosophy, he could move mountains. Under Palmer's grandmother, as a little girl, she saw, she fortunately was still with us, and as a little girl, she saw Gandhi speak in the park that she was And to this day, she only owns four songs. It's a profound effect he had on this tiny little girl. And of course, because she was embodying it himself. So this brings us to the thing. It was a bright for me when they told me that a cardinal expert was coming uh, to teach me thinning. A, I didn't know I was doing it in the play because it was a stage direction, it's not in the scene. And B, I didn't even know that our Chaka uh, prop worked. I thought it was a very just a natural sound too. So, Ashley Bush arrived at stage door one day to teach me how to thin. I was a little skeptical, and I just thought it was going to be a lot better. I thought. But as soon as I met her, the effect 
of thumb oil because it's been imposing the arterial staircase. Hits you. And um, if you imagine what I'm talking about, if there was something in the room that I saw this is that hit with that with that of what the effect of the must have had could have been like. Um, and she quietly and calmly took me out to sleep. And for those of you who do spin, you know that it takes less than a half hour to learn how to spin, but probably years to, to master. She showed me how simple the machine was to maintain and how even a child could do it. And yet the technology was beautiful, elegant, and clever. Gandhi took this ancient village grown technology that anyone could do. And he realized that with it, he could challenge the terrible injustice of the British Empire, where Indians produced the cotton, but then they had to sell it to British traders in order to pay their taxes. And then they had to buy it back once it had been processed in British mills. So his instructive program is that he was going to make the British Empire less than a spot. Because that's what it that's what anybody for extracting profits. His constructive program was to have everyone from the Prime Minister to the sweep spin shop. It's so clever because it encompasses localization, decentralization, and common people owning the means of their production of incentives and thus freeing them from under a spouse. More than this, it reconnected people to the spoil, to a sense of play. And for centuries, Western culture has been moving us in the opposite direction. It's been devaluing the the land, and people who work with their hands. So today, in this city, the most highly valued members of our society are those who work with a pen or a laptop. The class that found lockdown so pleasant. Because they could sit in their nice gardens, tapping away on their laptops and getting their food and other necessities delivered to them by the working classes, for whom lockdown was a luxury they couldn't afford. Now, the person who actually grows the food, or carves the wood, or spins the cloth, has been looked down on and has become an addendum to a polite society. And yet, Gandhi argued that if you are dependent on someone else for your food, clothing, and shelter, then you are the lower class person. Now, I'm not a very handy person. I've grown food for myself and I like to have my hands in the soil, but I've never really made it myself. And, but I soon realised the power of spin. I knew it intellectually because I've done my online course on constructive programs. But to sit with a handful of cotton fibers and watch them become thread in front of your eyes. With just the help of a simple chakra, was a lesson you cannot learn on this laptop. It's the thing of planting a tiny tomato seed in the spring and then having handfuls of tomatoes in the autumn. And the interesting thing is, today I was in the garden and when I was getting ready to come, I thought, oh, I should clean my nails because they were full of mud. And then I realised I was doing exactly the thing. I was thinking it wasn't polite to have the soil in my hands. And I did do it. <laughs> but that's interesting. Soil is not something that's bad. Um, so I realised quickly that it was um, very tricky and it was addictive. Um, and I realised I had to be fairly decent at it if I was going to do it on stage every night and look like Gandhi Spoon, who had spent a long time spoon. So I started to practice every day. I thought I'm going to practice every day in my house if I don't need them. And it became a running joke in the house that everyone would be working and Darby would be in the corner spinning. And sometimes I'm afraid to say I should swear on it because he couldn't, he couldn't get it right. Um, but it is meditative. And, uh, and they watch him just sliding over there with his chakra because the other thing is it's a spiritual practice, it's a meditation. Filling the mind. It's a one point of attention. And interestingly, all of them, young and old in the class, all my mom would come up to me and go, What is it that you're actually doing? And I'd show them the thread and I'd out of nowhere. And people were just astonished. 
this is how far removed we've come from reality. But the people, myself included, have no idea how a thread was made. And they're going, oh my god, that's the thread. That's now that's thread. And now I'm winding up this story and going, yeah, oh my god, I see that. It's the magic. Those things have been like magic. This is how impoverished we've become. We've become so dislocated from the land, from the place of belonging. And it marks the insanity of our culture. We grow apples and cans, and we ship them to China to be polished, and then we ship them back again. Did you know how to do that? Happens? That's a real thing that's happening right now. It doesn't make sense, but of course, from another viewpoint, it makes complete sense. Because if, it, if we didn't do it, we couldn't make money for the people who sell us these things. So the system is set up. The big business people, like the empire before them, they do steal us so that they can sell us the things that we used to be able to make ourselves. Now, even our childcare and our entertainment, how many other things can you think of that in the last 50 years have been taken from us and are now sold back to us to give us more time to work for money, to pay back the debts that we've accrued in order to keep this system growing, this system that is built on air. Spinning cloths would go on these symbolic and actual real injection of the system. So I was spinning, I was wearing pardon. I was visualizing the laugh and body language of two people in the Dalai We settled on the right words. It was in very important, for instance, that to have a good definition of ahimsa. Ahimsa, it can't just be translated as not being physically violent, it's enough. Peace is not just a state of permanent secret, we all know. We settled on the term a complete lack of ill will. Because if you bear no other person or creature ill will, if their, their welfare is genuinely important, then everything is fine. Finally, I would ask Gandhi to join me every evening. I believe in the concept, the Greek concept of the muses. We as artists are not making these things in our heads as Western materials in the time of the We're not just conjuring ideas and past experiences like clever hours. I believe that all art is a channel of creative powers that lie outside the sense. The singer, the sculptor, the spinner, the actor, the writer. On stage, I at my best, when I do my best work, I'm a channel for so Anupam, the writer. Who was a channel? Gandhi. Who was a channel? Fushri Krishna. To the extent that we can lose our powers, we can then let in those creative powers that can then flow through us. And you know, when you see the best things, the best actors, the best pain things, you see people lost, they lock themselves so that they can channel something bigger. So every night in the wings, I would invite Bobby to walk with me and keep me grounded and help me to forget that it wasn't about to remember that it wasn't about me. Sometimes there would be a light behind me in one of the wings as I was about to come on to the final climactic scene. And I would see my own shadow, my bald head, and I would be holding my star. And I would feel them there. I could see it. It was it was Strange. I try to do this with any character I play, fictional or real. You try to meet that person. You try to go on a journey to understand them. But in this case, it was a blessing and a privilege to walk some distance with them. And from the audience feedback, I can report that some of them felt that presence too. You can't say that to them, but it felt as presence. That's not because of me, that's because something has happened in the space between us. And the place certainly brought Gandhi to the attention of a lot of people, particularly young people who really knew nothing of him. So many young British Asian people come, and then they would come back with their aunties and uncles and aunts and brothers. Um, 
And I know from my own 14 year experience, a 14 year old set who's who saw the rich dad in the film. But once he's in your head, then all sorts of wonderful things can happen. So, what can we learn from Gandhi and apply to today? What are my notes from this process? Gandhi envisaged in India organized around village democracy, not a system where the great and the good decide what's best for the little people. A trait of both capitalism and socialism. Gandhi trusted the people because his worldview was one where people were innately good. Is this unrealistic? I'm afraid to say, Nehru, no, Patel, China, great, great leaders. They took India and Pakistan in a different direction to Gandhi's vision. And mystically, particularly as I felt like he played the flag, I did start to think, had he lived, I think he'd have ended up back in Britain, probably. He'd, of course, so much mystical. And interestingly, his great lieutenant, Bajra Khan, did. He spent more time in prison under the Pakistan government than he did under the British government. To be fair, he did live till 98. And he caused beautiful mystery fight into the 80s. Wonderful. Gandhi is his inspiration. So, Gandhi's idea of a village democracy is basically unrealistic, but Barcelona in the 30s made it of it. And today, the Kurds, I don't know if you know about this, but the Kurds have taken advantage of the chaos of the Syrian civil war and they formed a small state called Rojava. You can look it up, it's extraordinary verse. It's constantly under threat, but it's a village democracy. And, and interestingly, both those experiments in Barcelona and, and, and in the job now, women are central to decision making processes. It's like when you have true democracy, it seems that women become essential to the national. David Graeber and David Wenger have written an excellent book called The Dawn of Everything. I highly recommend it. And they show that contrary to popular belief, we haven't just been on a journey from tribes to this. Human beings have experimented all through thousands of years of history with ways of organizing themselves to seem incredibly exalted to us. They have archaeological proof. There is nothing inevitable about our current top down system. Gandhi spoke to this. Titan Young Porter is another interesting one there. He he's written a book called Fan Talk. And he talked of a completely different worldview of the Aboriginal. Australia, a worldview where people belong to the land and act accordingly against the opposite of our current culture. And what Gandhi did is he showed us that even in the complex modern world, these ideas could be reintroduced. He had hoped that India would be a beacon of that to challenge the, the Western model of development. And of course, just because something hasn't existed, it doesn't mean this is the beauty of the human species. We can imagine something and work together to make it happen. When he introduced for himself, it's what he was mad. Not where it took us. Now, I'm not expecting our so called leaders to lock the doors of the houses of parliament, declare the nation state a failed experiment, and hand power back to the people. Although, as Gandhi thought, it's anything is possible. So, we need a constructive program. To, to, to confront their excesses. But let's talk about constructive program. One of Gandhi's huge contributions was to realize that if we only oppose, then we have nothing to put in a corrupt system's place. Think of the Arab Spring. It faltered because people power didn't have anything there underneath. Carby was the cornerstone of this constructive program. Could we introduce spinning to every household in Britain or even in middle class India? It's a big, it's a long shot. But anything's possible. But there's something I think that Carly shows us that's even bigger than that. And that is it's a return, a return to the land. It's symbolic of a return to locus and non hierarchical organization. It's a return to a sense of belonging to a place. I believe that 
farming is going to be a huge part of the constructive program. We've become so disconnected from our food and clothes to the degree that Gandhi could not have imagined. Look at the work of modern Gandhians like Mother Shiva and such. We need to start, we all need and can start to grow food. It's something that everyone can do, young and old. It's symbolic, but you could also literally use it. Homegrown food tastes great and it empowers. Whether you have a garden with chickens or a pot of basil in your window sleep or front. I volunteer on a regenerative farm in Sufferance. A lot of people come just for their mental health. Well, why does it make us feel so good? Why does Spain make us feel good? It's something that Western culture completely discounts. And that's our power because they don't see us coming out. They don't see us doing it. Regenerative farming also sequestered mind boggling amounts of carbon and soil. It comes water in the land. It employs people in creative land work rather than the backbreaking media labor of agribusiness. And of course, regenerative agriculture means the growing and local production of the clothes that we wear. Cardi London skills could become, could enter everyone's home when we're growing ahead in this country, really, that we need to make our clothes. In other countries, it would be popular. Our culture has trapped us in the notion that for the faith in the world, we have to give up something. We have to stop being selfish. We have to stop being greedy. We need to wear hair shirts and live in poverty, because that would done for me. But the message of God is that all our pretty toys, our cars and phones and TVs, they're masking a deep hunger that they can never meet. The things we have lost are the things that materialism can never fill for us. We've lost connection to the rest of nature, the more than human world. And this isn't just virtual. Studies have shown that our gut microbiome is the shadow, the West, long westerners, is the shadow of our hunter gatherer and analysis policies. Chronic illness is epidemic and has increased exponentially. How many people do you know are on antidepressants? Our materialism is not working for us. And then think of the joy of Gandhi. It doesn't feel like he's given up anything. It feels like he's getting something. The root of the Sanskrit word Maya is that which can be measured. Western culture only values that which can be measured. In fact, it doesn't believe anything else even exists. But what do humans really value? Companionship. Joy, music, laughter, love. These are all unmeasurable. They're all priceless. Our new constructive program needs to show people that they don't need to give up anything. It's a win win scenario. The drug addict doesn't lose anything. He gives up the drugs and the key. Instead, he gains community and meaning. In the modern world, People are having to go to greater and greater lengths to have any sense of function or meaning. Free climbing, perilous mountain slopes, you've seen the videos, rowing solo across the Atlantic, developing virtual reality to make it feel like you are actually there. We are actually here. Could we find that meaning and that sense of adventure in our own hearts and our own communities? Just think about the joy of God. He was asked once why he never took a voca- vacation. And he said, I'm a Muslim vacation. <laughs> we look at the world this week particularly, and we may be tempted to say that Dharma has failed. The violence, the suffering, terrible polarization. But of course, these stories are only part of the human experience. It's the part that the media loves to show us, thinking us helpless and afraid. To quote Gandhi, history, and I would add the media, is a record of an interruption of the course of nature. Soul force being natural is not noted by history or the media. 
they don't see it. And so they don't show it. So we have to go and exist. All the millions of people this very moment loving their families, overcoming difficult conflicts peacefully, caring for a, dark, a dying loved one with no external reward or even recognition. The daily acts of heroism, without which we would go extinct in the many. To quote Gandhi again, as a Satyagraha, I hold to the faith that all activity pursued with a pure heart. Is bound to bear fruit, whether or not such fruit is visible to us. And of course, the fruit is all around us, even if we can't see it immediately. There are the large figures who were inspired by them, who changed the world, Martin Luther King, Nelson Mandela, etc. But there are millions of smaller people. Let me be home. The people of the nonviolent revolution of Serbia, the poor government of the people powered protest of Indonesia. But translate that Yagraha as offering dignity into practice. That's a great translation. The protest of the Occupy Wall Street, uh, to extinction rebellion, and in fact, pretty much any activist organization these days have no violence and potential parents. Imagine that 100, 100 years ago. Unthinkable. Who did that? Who was done? And what about the child's tiny constructive program? All over the world, who may have been inspired by him or one of his followers. I read a book recently called The Moneyless Man, a young man called Mark Boyd decided to live without money for a year. And he writes a blog that really interesting. Why did he start? Looking at preface. He read something about Gandhi. Millions, millions, millions of people. As we look around us, nothing, don't think. There are too many of us for the authority of the family. Can work right in a million different directions. And as an army of ants can bring down an elephant, our non violent army is unstoppable. I thought Gandhi would say, We have a working army. The ideas are out there and they can't be stopped. The powers that be just don't know it yet. And maybe we don't quite know it ourselves too. But of course, there will be only winners in this revolution. No one's been put up against the wall and shot. The corporate CEO and the secret policeman will have the joy of turning in their toxic riches and their weapons to discover community and belong that we already know is possible. Think of the truth and reconciliation issues in, in South Africa. People couldn't wait to get rid of the burden of their violence. So as we look around us, let us use our knowledge of Dharma. Local action, community empowerment, education, growing food, spinning food, producing at least some of the things we need ourselves. We can't all work on the scale of the Dharma. The real question we have to ask ourselves is, what is mine to do? For instance, I sometimes think I should give up acting. It seems quite likely to work on my friend's farm full time, or to retrain to work full time for open air, just that as a piece of it. And maybe one or both of those things are extraordinary. But at the moment, I seem to be called to be a storyteller, and a father, and a child to my elderly parents. And to make Gandhi, will very possibly be the highlight of my storytelling career. As the Gita says, do the work that is before you and leave the results to God. I'll leave you with one last quote from the Mahatma. The cause is great. The remedy is equally great. Let us prove worthy of the remedy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
is extremely important. Uh, sanctifying not only the body, but again, but also the heart. The body would say, Now, I'm sorry, I have to leave. It's simply because I have my long string to place the party. And if I don't pass it, I will be enjoyed. And the rest of the time. <laughs> and no amount of non violence is not possible. So, uh, my apologies to the audience and the group. I uh, greatly enjoyed it. If there was more time, you would have talked with great deal about it. And there's some happiness to the world more about it. Why we didn't care for the world, we didn't do anything about that. So, that's for another occasion, and I hope you will come and you will have a good day. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you for you know. Yes, um, thanks for actually we have some cardiologists which are now going to thanks to the Mary Center for present to be you and call. Say thanks. Thanks to all of you. We to talk to you know, please call them to and talk to you for them for with some couple of some uh, cool things. Say thank you for the lecture. Thank you very much for doing our Thank you. 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 So, if we have a quick QA, um, Joe will, if you think it has a, if you've got a question, probably will take you in batches and then Paul will answer, and Asha and um, Joe will also make contributions to Cardi London. Thank you. Also, the cover is This is the pain of the I hope. I'm Joe Sauter, I'm the director at Cardi London, and we've only finished the day one downstairs at the moment, so um, come back tomorrow and see it because it's fantastic all about Cardi. Um, I'm going to take some questions now, so if anyone's got any questions for Paul or indeed Asha, then please just sit down. Hello, Namaste. Uh, this year, I'm there. <laughs> I'll wait a bit. Um, I did watch the show last uh, last season, I believe. And the movement, and especially the reaction of our um, video. And everyone was fantastic. One thing that caught my attention is that on the stage on the top, we have three bullets hanging from the ceiling. And right from the beginning that I sat there watching the show, my eyes are always okay. Yes, I mean, is this the paint that's hanging from the ceiling all the time while you know you are playing right from the beginning? Was it from the director or what inspired you to actually come up with that prop? I think um, what it was was because they're only there at the beginning, and as soon as the place starts to disappear, because it would have been too distracting, I think they had them all the time. I think they wanted the audience to come in because what Andrew Palmer's challenge was was that there was a lot of people who knew a lot about the story, a lot of South Indian heritage, a South Asian heritage. But there was an also a huge amount, the majority of people knew nothing. Not talking on food. So the only people at the end came up to me and said, Why don't we know anything about this? This is our history. We know not, nothing about it. So I think they wanted to sh show from the beginning this is a play about a murder. Someone's going to be killed. And then, of course, when God said he comes on, straight away he said, I know. So I think it was a, a visual. Uh, Direction or clue towards the fact that 
lifted the plates leading us to a place. And you may forget because we're going to go back 30, 50 years, but eventually we're going to arrive back in the end. And this is where we are headed. Um, yeah, so the market is destroyed, but I think it's the directors who will be designed to do such. But yes, yeah, so that was the thing that we took that from the tree. I also think that it's for us, it's a human society, it's very important to see and understand where the idea of uh, individual um, terrorism or terrorism um, and mass to kill people emerges from it. Because it, it's no point in just hating a person or, or, or the group of people. We need to find out how it happens. So this this way tells us how the transformation of Nathuram Gopse from a rejected child um, to become a violent person and hate an ideology. I think it's just the thing, but to hate the ideology come. And if you notice, it's still happening, isn't it? So that's why it's more and more important. And I think Gandhi is possibly saying, do you want to punish these people and you feel good about them? Or do you want it to stop them? Because we can carry on with that cycle of violence. But as the Buddha said, violence begets violence. It's an eternal war. So yes, we can carry on with that. We can punish them. We can kill them. It might make us feel good in our range of um, pain. Or do we want it to stop? So that it doesn't so we cut chain that link to violence. And Gandhi is not going to be this topic than putting people in prison or hiding people. Besides, he would say that hate the act, not the person. And to change the person, you can only use love. I think there's also that putting yourself in someone else's shoes way again, isn't there? You can put yourself in the person that. You automatically get an animosity towards them, whether a negative feeling yourself towards that person. How could they do that dreadful thing? You know, the sort of moral sort of terrorism. Then, when you put yourself in their shoes, I can feel so. You can see that's how that could work. Then maybe you can come to a point where you can actually think of a solution. And I think this is where the polarization that has often become in social media is so dangerous. It's weak. Who's fighting you? And I'm so constantly in solidarity. That's the question you want. Rather than saying, are you on the side of the human beings in that conflict? Um, and the safety of the world. And, and people don't want to hear that. At the moment. They want to know who's side you on. Who are you? Who's on your team? Well, if you're on the team with that person, then I'm not talking to them because they are a blah, blah, If you've shared the stage with Sanka, then sorry, you're cancelled. As if you can cancel a human being. You know, and, and I think that's where polarization is working exactly against that. The it's yeah. It's then in its way of politics as well. Absolutely. It's very important to join the two parties and to support one and the other. But we can use. Um, any more questions? It's interesting when we picked up on the West, like in sector around the island of the period of battle that were more involved at the Place of the hero in theory and history, right? The, the idea that there might be millions of actors today in some way, but for them to add up, you need them to decide what you need to hate. Uh, to, to, um, I wonder if you were to study a design, if you found anything about his view of whether a hunter in every day can add up to something without the absence a likely of a, a figure of this design. Well, I know he's uncomfortable with the term of heart because he felt it was disempowered. So the people would go, well, the Mahatma would do it for us. So I know that was very clear that he wrote about. Um, and I think for him, it was all about coming from the home, from the place of, you know, and as the Gita says, you know, it starts with the home, then it grows to the, uh, the, the community, the village. Uh, the country, the world, you know, the universe. And um, I, and that's why we talk about the importance of women in the all the time. And he said the future of non-violence is in women, because I think he saw that 
without the empowerment of women within those communities, we couldn't have uh, a genuine movement as a people. So I think he was, and that's why I think again he wasn't friendly with men because he wasn't interested in being a great leader. He was interested in he was interested in this. He was interested in that he called off the the Satyagraha, uh, which one was it, the Art of Joy Chula. Uh, he, he called off, you know, the cancer that the movement had up on. So he believed in leaving in that way. But that's because he believed in the, the discipline of an insight. And I think he felt that Satyagraha would not work. He would, it, it, the experiment he wants to show the world wouldn't work if there was not discipline. But on the other hand, I think, you know, he felt totally confident after his death. But, it would continue because it's about truth, and truth is not about the individual. Born in Coleman, the Red Mountain, studied in Rajput, mother holy morning, very timid and shy. Came to England, Mr. Gandhi, in South Africa, it was called Billy Barrister, and then Gandhi Bhai, brother Gandhi. He started actions in the end of Babu, came to India, became Mahatma. So from Mohan to Mahatma, what did we do? Nothing. He just he was certainly truthful. As a child in Rajput, he stole a piece of gold from his brother's family, who made a big cigarette, who tasted meat. But the truth made him true Mohan. And all throughout his life, if you study his life in action, nothing but true, nothing. He was afraid of not being true. That was only his fear. Um, that was a really inspiring talk. Uh, so thank you so much. Um, and I went to see the play, I went to stay with a friend, I had one of those traffic salvations. He was not taught any colonial history throughout my whole education. So I'm a student of um, Something that I had not considered before I saw, but I actually didn't have the place up before, before I went, um, was the role of gender. And gender is such a huge theme for play. Um, and there, there is a real sense of masculine rage and masculine um, kind of violence in the assassination. And I was wondering if that was one because of the modern age we live in and the topic that we are in the Salafi right, if that was intentional and parallels were intentional to um the way that we view masculinity at the moment um or the fringes of masculinity. And how did you and the past kind of respond to those needs? Oh and then a uh, last kind of deep question. Um, the stage of the name. What was that like? <laughs> uh, as a, as a follow-up to that curiosity. So, Anne Palmer, obviously a woman, but she she has particular genes in capturing young men. She just can feel it. She knows how to write their words to the extent where I felt oh, we needed more women. <laughs> And um, in to speak, and Villela, who was the upper right, who she ended up taking a lot of Gandhi's words, which I think was right, because we needed to hear the women around Gandhi, who surrounded by the strong women, speak. And so she, she ended up speaking a lot of Gandhi's thoughts in the play. Um, so I was happy with that. But I think as well, you know, there is um. I think what a lot of the gender debate misses at the moment is there's a saying, it's an African saying, if you do not initiate the young men, they will burn down the village just to feel its heat. And I think we have lost generations of young men to this anger that doesn't have any meaning. We don't give them meaning and we don't give them their role is the sacredness, which counter, which which balances the sacred feminine. The sacred feminine has been suppressed, and the sacred masculine has been ignored, so that a toxic masculine has risen. 
And I think it's someone like Matula. And I always want to go and never to use his name. He always called me last first name Matula. Because I think he was a young man who became lost in that angry, violent story. And I think that's why Gandhi said, I hate sir. True I hate sir. Yeah, I think it's remember the exact words, but it's like the future is female, true hate. Because I think he understood that according to the, the patriarchy, women would more easily be the power first and that the young men who were lost in this world of physical strength would find it harder and not impossible but it would be harder for them to make that journey um so i think you know look at look at what's been happening this week there's a lot of violence on both sides of what's happening in israel Palestine, being conducted primarily by young men who have been told that they are doing something actually useful uh, and I think it's because the men are lost. And I think we need, you know, we need to bring them back. We need to bring them back to the land. We need to bring them back to a sense of meaning. We need to, um, and so I think, yes, it was, you know, also, I'm part of to tell us, it was difficult because the people she was telling the story about were all men. Gandhi, Jinnah, Patel, uh, Nehru, um, in terms of the power structures. Then you had Godson and his best friend Akte, who killed him. So they were all men. So it was difficult, which is why she brought the mother in and she brought the mother, the astronaut in. But I would have somehow, I did feel we could have tried to get more women's voices in, and I'm not sure how it would have happened. But yeah, I think um, it's, it's, it's difficult, isn't it? Because when you tell a historical story where the main players are men, it's, 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 and, and, and female rights, you know, so, yeah, but I think it's, 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 it's troubling, and I think it's fiction we have to have. It's what's so crucial to have the female lens to the time, yeah. and the female lens is actually a bit revolutionary. So we have a female designer, a, a, a South Asian female designer, a South Asian female designer, a South Asian female designer. That is literally unheard of in history. And we need so much more. I mean, look at the films, look at everything that's being portrayed. The women's voices are so, so huge. Um, yeah, so I think the solution to that is more female voices. And the, 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 did, you, did you mean the revolve? Were you talking about the revolve? Yeah, the revolve was, could, be, could be unsettling sometimes. <laughs> the, the trouble with you when you step on and off, that was when you're on it, it's like, uh, when you're off it, you're fine, but if you try to step on it in the wrong way, you could look a bit, look a bit wrong something, so, which I did do in Canada. So, it's not good when you're trying to look like a, a leader or make a speech, it was something like that. But it was very effective, I think, storytelling too. Yeah, for me, uh, as a non-Indian South Asian, I Home stream service, so NT home, where it means anybody could stream it um, at home or on the video that they're on Wi Fi. But then when they decided to put the play on again, obviously they didn't want to release it, they wanted people to come and see the new version. So I'm hoping, and they definitely have plans to release it at some point, so we need to keep an eye on that because I know a lot of people in India and in America would like to see it on um, so so yes, it will happen at some point, and it will be last year's production, which I'm a bit sad about because 
I managed to finally in this in this situation to squeeze in, persuade him that he could when he was shocked to stay in Iran, which I thought was crucial and we locked we didn't have it uh, last time, but in this latest version, as he died, he looked at what said and said they are, which I thought was a crucial part of what he was giving us in his in his life. But do you almost have to imagine him saying it? Yeah. <laughs> but he did see it that. That's what I mean. And they wouldn't put it in the original production. I argued and argued for it, but I think Indu was worried that the audience wouldn't understand it or that it would be seen to be some kind of political statement. But I said that what he said, because that was his production, because he said drama all his life. And it was a forgiving, it was a sign of love to his killer as a guy in my opinion. I lost that one. This time, I badgered them until they let me sound. <laughs> but can I just say something? Sorry. You know, I lived with that period because I'm old enough to live with that period. And seeing the demonstration that you saw going on parliamentary, going on parliamentary in New Delhi. And when the soldiers would come and beat all the people, who were there just because they loved Gandhi, not necessarily because they were agreed with what he said, because he so revered, he was so revered that he was baffled. And anything he said has got to be right. So if he said, be non violent and get beaten if necessary, but just stay there, they did it. And they used to get beaten horribly, I can tell you. Know, very nice to watch. Yeah. yeah. I think you touched on something really important there, because of course, you know, you have the different ways to the people talks about, you know, party and service. Um, but love, devotion, is a great part from the particularly in the spiritual tradition. And you know, there's a great um in the Gita where it says, if you can meditate, yes. If you can't meditate, you can find a path of service. If you can't do any of that, at least love, because love will take you on that path of realization. And I think because Gandhi was so true to himself, and because he lived like the poorest of people, people genuinely loved him, and the love gave him strength. And so they didn't need to know the political philosophy behind it. They just loved him. And the British could not, you, you know, any of the oppressive power cannot cope with love. That's the point. This entire movement is that love can trump whatever hatred and purpose. So I think that's a bit of a problem that you saw that. Yeah. Oh, that's the reason why they don't like You know, this is why he used to fight in the early days with his wife, because he insisted they were came from the truth. It's war. You know, and again, it's it's a, it's a, it's trying to if one you know, he would say, look at the poorest, meanest living person you can think of and that you've ever seen. And then every decision you make is will that make will my decision today make that person's life better? So he wanted to his, you know, absolutely relentless push was to make himself like that person so that he could be as simple as possible. And it was the, that was one of the sources of his power. And they hey, were afraid to go there, most people. You know, we see a homeless person who feel terrible, but to go there to actually say, I'm giving everything away so that I can be like this person or help that person. You know, we fear it, and it's the other side of the world, human beings. So he had a kind of drive to do that. 
And that was a real sort of I think that's a lovely place to end it. I'm really oh. sorry, but we can certainly need it. But I think the place to end it is you know, to try, to try to be um, as good as we can be, but you don't have to be able to have it. You know, we'll do the best that we can do. To... Do you know that Gandhi is not the person, but it's a school of thought. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So I just want to say thank you so much to Paul.